So first of all, thanks, Corey, for, for posting your video to unpack some of what we've been discussing on Facebook um, after I, I posted this video by uh, Neil Thies, who I believe is a medical doctor, but he's interested in these more <clears throat> speculative ideas, um, complexity theory and panpsychism in particular. And um, Corey, I'm glad that, that you are raising some of these issues, you know, I should admit right off the bat, and maybe this is frustrating, um, I, I have recently had to clarify that on Facebook, I don't um, always agree with the perspective or perspectives being expressed by, by voices in what I share on Facebook. So if I post a news article or um, a video about panpsychism, you know, obviously there's something about it I think is worth sharing with people, but it doesn't mean that I agree with the particular formulation of uh, what's being, um, you know, what's being argued by the, the people there. And I, I know I should offer more commentary to curate what I post, but so this is all just to say that um, Neil Thies's version of panpsychism is, is not necessarily um, the, the formulation that I would want to use. I posted it more because um, I think it's he's raising an interesting um, set of hypotheses, and they are not really um, experimentally testable in the way that the positive sciences have come to understand experiment. Right, so so they're speculative. But the whole point, I think, of speculative philosophy it it, it it's it's never been to prove something. Um, in some sort of logical or deductive sense. Speculative philosophy is, you know, inductive, but also more than just that, it's more than just an inductive um, drive to generalize. It's also um, an attempt to elucidate our experience, right? To shed light on what it is that we encounter in the world, in, in reality, as beings among beings, you know, in a field of activity. It, when we when we do speculative philosophy and talk about things like panpsychism, um, when we talk about the ultimate nature of reality and we, we we seek after that most general form of truth about things um, and about life, uh, yeah, we're gonna you know be saying something that for 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 most of us most of the time is it, it's like who cares it elicits the response who cares because it's so general it, it unless it's contextualized um, made to fit in with and link up with concrete um, daily activities you know the, the presuppositions of our of our civilized existence here together and ethics and um, values and you know world views and all the all the ways that we inhabit um, an ethical social space with one another as conscious beings um, if we don't connect speculative philosophizing to the the daily life of um, you know that makes up our human existence then uh, yeah it is irrelevant and who cares but I think there is a way of um, and really a justification for some form of panpsychism maybe not Neil thesis, um, if that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Neil will join in and, and share uh, his own response to to our criticisms of his video. Um, but some form of panpsychism, I think, is of value to us precisely because of how it allows us to re-inhabit the the earth in a in a new or maybe just forgotten way. Well, I mean, if we're going to re-inhabit it, it, it might be both a remembering of something lost and uh, an, an inventing or a creation of something, you know, that inherits what was lost. But it obviously would be um, different. It would need to have adapted to its new environment. So what would that relevance be? What, what, why, why, would, why do I argue for <clears throat> a form of panpsychism, though, as Corey points out, I refer to it as pan-experientialism, which hints at uh, a particular, you know, school of thought within the panpsychist, um, you know, lineage, and that would, that would be to Alfred North Whitehead's lineage. Pan-experientialism is not a word that Whitehead himself used, I should 
I should add, um, David Ray Griffin, a prominent Whiteheadian philosopher and theologian, actually coined the term to distinguish Whitehead's unique form um, of so-called panpsychism from just the, the idea that soul is everywhere or life is everywhere in, in the standard meanings of the terms. Um, Whitehead's pan-experientialism is a more refined form of um, speculation about what it means to say that the entirety of the of the universe is um, in some way there for itself. It has uh, interiority, it has presence. Um, there is something it is like to be everything that there is. And if there is something, then that something has a perspective on the world. It, 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 there is no such thing as pure, as a pure object that simply is there, that isn't there for itself, right? And, you know, when we try to talk about pure objects, what we're really doing is, you know, trying to arrive at some intersubjective agreement among all concerned parties. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, mathematicians are doing this with, with their their symbols, um, with their symbolic activities. You know, an equation isn't just a, a static thing there on the page, though we can speculate about how it might refer to a platonic um, idea that is fixed and eternal and unchanging. But the equation itself, as, as practiced, as brought to life by the mathematician, it's a process. Um, it's an activity. So... You know, when mathematicians um, try to coordinate their symbolic activities, um, whether they're doing calculus or, um, you know, statistics, um, they're looking for a way to agree about um, the relationships between objects, pure objects, the pure relationships between pure objects. Um, that don't really exist, those objects, they can't exist independent of the mathematical activity that's going on within these communities of thinkers. Um, the equations have to be understood as one way that a process comes to consciousness of itself. Um, so, you know, Whitehead's pan-experientialism has implications not only for how we think about the physical world, but for how we think about the mental world. And what I've been trying to do in, in you know, describing mathematics in this way is put mind, put the mental uh, activities of, of, of mathematicians and scientists and physicists back into the natural world. And then to ask, well, what must nature be such that um, physical, uh, mathematical physics is possible, such that physical science is possible. How is it that the universe is able to do that to itself? Um, and when I ask that question, yeah, I mean, emergence is, is one way of starting to get at it, because clearly what the universe was doing um, four and a half billion years ago, when the Earth was still a molten ball of, of fire, is very different from what the Earth is doing today. Very different. Um, but somehow, the rock uh, grew eyes and started breathing. And, you know, on the one hand, when we, when we say that the Earth has been alive from the very beginning, what, what we're saying is nothing different than that in the beginning it was more an egg form, right? And it, most of the activity was taking place at a microscopic scale and it looked like there was just a dead crust on the outside, but actually you saw the, you know, volcanic acne spewing um, blood, molten blood out from the center. And, and if you had subtler senses, you could detect the electromagnetic field that was almost, you know, in, in dynamic um, interaction with the sun's magnetic field and that together the sun with its visible light and radiation, um, its visible light and its detectable radiation, heat and light, 
as well as its electromagnetic activity, which is invisible, and you know we understand to some degree um, due to quantum theory that the energy that is traveling and the information that is traveling through the electromagnetic field connecting the sun and the earth um, and connecting all parts of the earth to itself, this electromagnetic activity is not um, efficient causation, it's not propagation through space at some finite speed, it's all traveling at the speed of light so-called, which isn't a speed at all, it's not moving because it's everywhere at once already. Um, so there's a non-local entanglement, an energetic entanglement, an informational entanglement between the sun and the earth, between the earth and all the various um, points of the earth, and that I think especially um, highly adapted, highly evolved, let's say, um, highly adaptable organisms with, with very complex nervous systems, um, that, that, that those forms of life that, the, that have grown from out of the earth are sort of like um, antennas, and as they become more complex, as an organism evolves and complexifies itself, both internally and socially, um, it becomes a more sensitive antenna for detecting that um, non-local information field that connects it to the earth and that connects the earth to the sun and that almost certainly um, connects the sun to the center of our galaxy. And you know we're, we, what we find ourselves doing here um, when we situate ourselves cosmically is um, that there are a series of nested centers or a series of nested self-organizing systems and each one I would speculate or a pan-experientialist would, would speculate is in some way conscious of itself but the consciousness of the galaxy um, well one thought takes you know a hundred billion years whereas the consciousness of a human being that one thought um, takes takes a few seconds um, you know the length of a sentence, and maybe some long sentences, uh, when when understood, are um, stretching our our experience of um, the comprehensiveness of a thought. But and then you know when you zoom down again to a cell, a thought is much quicker, and a single neuron, you know, is its impulse is um, you know a few uh, tenths of a second or thousandths of a second. So, as you go down the scale of nature, the, uh, the breadth of what it means to have a conscious thought shrinks. And once you get to the atomic and subatomic level, um, from our human perspective, the, the, the experience or the consciousness or the thought capacity of that system is minuscule, it vanishes into, um, you know, what seems like mere mechanical uh, reiteration, um, just repetition of, of what happened before, determinism. But, but we know that there is randomness there, and to say that is nothing more than to say that our ep epistemic methods, our way of framing and theorizing about nature um, in terms of quantum theory, um, is based on, I think it's called a renormalization, right? So the smallest length, the Planck length, um, at that scale, we're, we're sort of, um, uh, we have to find a way to formalize infinity because ultimately um, our instruments can only detect uh, a certain degree um, of activity and at some point we just have to say anything past this point doesn't count anymore and that works well enough because the scale is so vast 